Hi, it's Monday, January the 10th, and I continue to read and wonder my way through the book of Genesis. And today it's Genesis chapter 27, verses 1 through 30, which is a lot. <laughs> um, but um, I don't know how else to divide this up. I mean, we're, we're, we're getting into, well, this is where everything falls apart for Esau and Jacob. And um, we'll do the story over at least two days, but I don't know how to break it up no more because he just sort of can't stop in the middle of, of a battle, you know? Um, so, well, you'll see what happens. See what you think. Um, last week we finished up with um, uh, Isaac had settled in uh, in the land of the Philistines in the uh, in the valley of Gerar, um, had avoided famine, was thriving. Anyway, at the end of that, he had sort of made his peace, I think, with himself, but had made a, a formal peace also with with the uh, with the king Abimelech, and so was settled there. And then we jump into this chapter. Um, oh, that's right. The other thing, though, that happened at the very end of last week's reading, just tucked into the end of chapter, chapter 26, is that Esau had married Hittite wives and made life bitter for Isaac and Rebekah. We have no other details. <laughs> well, we are told that. Ah, kids. So anyway, uh, Genesis chapter 27, verses 1 through 30. Here we go. When Isaac was old and his eyes were, were dim so that he could not see, he called his elder son Esau and said to him, my son, he answered him, here I am. He said, see, I, I am old. I, I do not know the day of my death. Now then take your weapons, your quiver and your bow and go out to the field and hunt game for me. Then prepare for me savory food such as I like and bring it to me to eat so that I may bless you before I die. Now Rebekah was listening when Isaac spoke to his son Esau. So when Esau went to the field to hunt for the game to bring it, Rebekah said to her son Jacob, I have heard your father say to your brother Esau, bring me game and prepare for me savory food to eat, that I may bless you before the Lord before, the Lord before I die. Now therefore, my son, obey my word as I command you. Go to the flock, get me two choice kids, so that I may prepare from them savory food for your father, as just as he likes, and you shall take it to your father to eat, so that he may bless you before he dies. But Jacob said to his mother, Rebekah, Look, my brother Esau is a hairy man, and I am a man of smooth skin. Perhaps my father will feel me, and I shall seem to be mocking him and bring a curse on myself and not a blessing. His mother said to him, Let your curse be on me, my son. Only obey my word and go, get them for me. So he went and got them and brought them to his mother, and his mother prepared savory food such as his father loved. Then Rebekah took the best garments of her elder son Esau, which were with her in the house, and put them on her younger son Jacob. And she put the skins of the kids on his hands and on the smooth part of his neck. And then she handed the savory food and the bread that she had prepared to her son Jacob. So he went into his father and said, My father. And he said, Here I am. Who are you, my son? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you have told me. Now sit up and eat of my game so that you may bless me. But Isaac said to his son, How is it that you have found it so quickly, my son? He answered, Because the Lord your God granted me success. Then Isaac said to Jacob, Come near, that I may feel you, my son, to know whether you really are my son Esau or not. So Jacob went up to his father Isaac, who felt him and said, Your voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. He did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like his brother's Esau's hands, so he blessed him. He said, Are you really my son Esau? He answered, I am. And then he said, Bring it to me, that I may eat of my son's game and bless you. So he brought it to him, and he ate. And he brought him wine, and he drank. Then his father Isaac came to him, Come near and kiss me, my son. So he came near and kissed him. And he smelled the smell of his garments and blessed him. And said, Ah, the smell of my son is like the smell of a field that the Lord has blessed. May God give you the dew of heaven and the fatness of the earth and plenty of grain and wine. Let people serve you and nations bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers and may your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be everyone who curses you and blessed be everyone who blesses you. And I'm going to stop right there. So, hmm, <laughs> What are we to make of this? Um, I guess I'm a little bit confused. Uh, so, so Rebecca and Jacob. I mean, we call Jacob the trickster, and 
and and and he is um, now he's <sighs> tricksters are important. Uh, they're important in almost every culture. Um, I mean, whether you're talking sort of in indigenous cultures around North America uh, and, and 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 coyote. Um, the trickster, or I mean, African stories with trickster, or whether, like me, I mean, I grew up loving Simon Templar, the saint, definitely a trickster. Uh, Bugs Bunny, a trickster. Um, we love tricksters. Tricksters, uh, tricksters break rules. Tricksters don't know boundaries. Tricksters do their thing, and in doing so, well, sometimes wonderful things happen. Um, and yet, <laughs> and yet, uh, they are of great benefit to all those around them, although they end up somehow suffering themselves. Sometimes they make things happen when when systems just aren't making it happen. At least that's my analysis of what tricksters bring uh, to the table in, in various um, stories. Um, they sometimes suffer. In fact, they nearly always suffer to a degree. Um, but they, they, they allow things to happen. I mean, for instance, and, I, and I've wondered about this for a couple of generations now, so when are all these kids coming? When, when are all these descendants that, that, that the covenant with God has promised? Uh, well, it, it's, it's with what's going to happen with, with, with Jacob and Esau that the floodgates are opened and, and things begin to happen. So, so the trickster does that. But, but I noticed that this trickster um, is very much a liar, and, 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 and tricksters are liars, no question about it. But... But I mean, bold face, liar. Who are you? Oh, I'm Esau. Are you sure you sound like Jacob? Nope. No, nope. Pretty sure I'm Esau. Uh, you know, uh, he has the opportunity. He 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 lies, and, and as much as he's the trickster, so too is his mother Rebecca. I mean, this is her cunning plan. This is not this is not um, Jacob's plan. Now Jacob pulls it off. Uh, and Jacob has to improvise a little bit, uh, obviously, um, with the like, well, how did you get back so quickly? Well, because the, because the Lord blessed me. So, so Jacob is absolutely contributing. So Jacob is a trickster. But so is Rebecca, to my mind. Now, we don't call Rebecca the trickster. Um, but I wonder whether that's a, a gender bias. Um, uh, or, or, or what we do with that, because she very clearly has told us that she, she's overheard, she's come up with the plan, she's making this happen. And I have to ask myself, why? And the text says, well, Jacob is her favorite. Uh, and so she wants the best for her favorite, for her her favorite son. Uh, and we will discover the same thing much later with uh, with um, with Bathsheba and and and, and her son to to become uh, successor to David. Uh, and she makes that happen. There are other possibles, but no, she's going to make that happen. Rebecca's doing it here too. Uh, I got it, um, but but I'm not satisfied with that entirely. Uh, I mean, if we put this whole story together, Rebecca had a troubled, a difficult pregnancy. And it was painful, and she prayed to God, and she and God spoke to her. So she had, I guess in folklore we'd call an omen. She has some kind of communication with God, whether it's a dream, a voice, a burning bush. We're not really told that. Um, it's not the angel Gabriel like with Mary, but... But, but she has a communication with God, and God says, your kids are not going to get along. Your kids, the eldest is going to serve the youngest. God said that. It's a done deal. I think I mentioned last week, or even maybe a couple of days you know, in, into last week ago, um, when, when Esau sold his, his, uh, his, his birthright to, to Jacob, um, that, um, that Luther... Uh, suggested that there's no transaction there at all because God has already decreed that the birthright belongs to Jacob, right? Um, so Esau doesn't really have anything to trade away and Jacob doesn't have anything to trade for because he's already got it. So God's already done this. And, and so we're aware of that. God has said this. This is done. This is God's done this. So is Rebecca fulfilling what God has told her? So when Re when God spoke to Rebecca and said, um, your, 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 your eldest will serve your youngest. 
They're not going to get along. Your eldest will serve your youngest. When, when God said that, did Rebecca hear that as a directive? So do what you can to make sure this happens. Or did Rebecca hear it as a prediction, a promise from God? This is what is going to happen. So if, if the former, then in a sense, Rebecca is acting on holy orders. Um, but that's really not what the text tells us. God says this is going to happen, not I need you to help me make this happen. This isn't like Noah, I need you to build an ark. Okay, this is this is what's going to happen. So for me, God has already said this will happen. But Rebecca isn't convinced, perhaps. So Rebecca takes matters into her own hands. I go back and I remember Abraham and Sarah. God promised them offspring. They're not having any. And Sarah says, well, you know what, Abe? Why don't you sleep with Hagar, my servant? Have a, have a child with her. Then we can get this whole thing started. Uh, and, 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 and that way God's will will be done. Instead of waiting for God's will to be done on God's time, um, Sarah decided to, to make it happen on, on her time. Um, uh, and, and that didn't really work out very well. <laughs> uh, and, and so I'm going to say the same kind of thing is happening here. Rebecca knows what God has said, but is not willing to be patient. Not trusting God to make it happen so she is going to make it happen. And Jacob goes ahead with it too because it suits Jacob. I mean, Jacob doesn't say at any point, oh, mom, this is wrong. I can't lie to my father. Uh, he says, yeah, but what if I get caught and he, and he curses me? He, he's afraid for himself. Uh, so there's no moral issue here for, for, for Jacob, the trickster. There are rarely moral issues for tricksters. Um, there's no moral issue for him here. Uh, he just doesn't want to get caught. Um, but I think the way the story is presented over, over the, for us, the chapters, over the, is that we're invited to wonder a little bit about, about that. Um, when we take action... Are we taking action in faith or are we taking action because we lack faith? And it's not an easy, it's not an easy one. I mean, there were those who have sat back and said, uh, when looking at what's going on in, in, in South Africa 40 years ago, uh, well, you know, just leave it be. Apartheid will, will come to an end. We don't need to do that. We don't need to, to, to rush an end to apartheid. Um, but then sanctions and international voices and internal struggle um, put an end to apartheid. Should we have sat back and said, well, if God wants it to happen, God will make it happen? No, I don't think so. I think we are meant to take action. But then there are other times when, when we rush because God's not doing it fast enough or not doing it the way that we think it should be done. Uh, for me, this is simply an invitation to wonder about my motivations. Am I, am I participating in the will of God or am I trying to direct the will of God? Um, am I, you know, am I in this with God or am I trying to make God's will sort of fit into my agenda, my schedule? Um, I mean, is Jacob Rebecca's favorite son uh, because of this of this omen, uh, because of the, these words from God, um, or you know, would it have been different if God had said this, uh, but and she didn't like Jacob? <laughs> would 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 she still be doing this, or would she just sort of like ah, just let it be? We'll see what happens. Um, that's the beauty of Scripture for me. Is it, it's not it's not Aesop's fable. Um, you know, nobody's going to fall into the water. Nobody's going to get uh, get stuck with sour grapes. There's no obvious moral of the story. There's an invitation to wonder. Um, when we do things, are we doing them because we believe that's what God wants us to do? Or are we doing them because this is what we believe God should want to do? So we're making it happen. And, and I say that from, from, from all sorts of different perspectives. I mean, I've been involved with a number of things that are absolutely right. And of course, I believe they're right. And I believe that God wants us to do those things. But do I ever stop and go, well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Is this really the will of God? Or is this my sense of a good thing? And so I'm just going to find a way to make it the will of God. 
or am I really listening to the will of God? That's the challenge here. And there's no answer for me in this. Is Rebecca listening to the will of God? I'm not worried about Jacob. Jacob's listening to the will of his mother. Not, no question in my mind there. Um, but Rebecca has talked to God, has heard God explain what was going to happen. So is Rebecca doing this because she's inspired by God or is she doing this because Jacob is her favorite son and she's going to make this happen? Um, so that's the invitation for me into this is, is, is to wonder. And I guess I'm also, there's a little invitation in this too for me to kind of wonder just a little bit about who I might be in the story. Am I Jacob? Am I Esau? Jacob is by far the more interesting character. I mean, let's, let's be honest. Um, in, in fact, thus far, Jacob might be the most interesting character. <laughs> uh, that's not fair. The most interesting male character, right? Abraham, yeah, he goes back and forth. He suffers, um, I, I, I do think, suffers from, from uh, ill spirits. I don't want to call it depression. I'm not a diagnostician. But, but he does seem to go in, in, into depressive times and comes out of them. But he generally does what God wants, wants him to do. Uh, challenges God occasionally, which is kind of cool, but still um, does what God wants him to do. Uh, Adam, Noah, they pretty much, you, you know what they're doing. Uh, even Lot, as comical as he is, pretty much just sort of follows a straight path. Jacob, on the other hand, is a pretty good guy, and yet he's a liar. <laughs> uh, respects his mother, and yet deceives his father. Um, we know going in that he is the chosen one in this story, that the covenant is going to be lived out through him. So we kind of like him, and yet he doesn't necessarily act in such a way that we could be that we should admire him. Having said that, he does not make life bitter uh, for his parents, unlike his brother Esau, who married Hittite wives and made life bitter. Um, and we keep calling Jacob the younger son, but we understand that younger is by seconds. <laughs> it's not years apart. So when I look at the two, Esau has gone off and married. He has, he has wives, more than one wife. He has wives. Um, he is making life bitter for Isaac and Rebecca. Meanwhile, Jacob is still at home. Esau is the hunter, and 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 he, and he does all those things. We we know that because he smells like he's out there hunting. Um, smells of the field, smells of the farm. Whereas Jacob is is good in tents. He's good in the kitchen. Um, so um, you know, there's a part of him that goes like, "Well, good for you going against sort of that um, that number one son." masculine jock guy no no you're the guy who knows how to get things done and as i mentioned in a previous reflection he's the one who's said to be at peace the word used to describe him is the same word that god uses to describe job as one who is uh, mild um basically at peace so jacob is at peace and yet he's a trickster and a liar fascinating character so i i, I think that 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 as as this, um, as Genesis develops, um, we are invited into these characters. And Jacob so far is the one that I think the most of us can connect to a little bit here, a little bit there. Maybe because we are the younger sibling who, as much as we may love our older sibling every now and then, goes, yeah, well, man, doesn't she always get the preferential treatment? Yeah, the eldest always gets it. You know why? The eldest is always so special. I only get hand-me-downs, even though he's just seconds younger. So you know, we may recognize that. We may recognize the one who doesn't want to fit into the stereotypical, um, uh, what we have called here in this scripture anyway, sort of that masculine, uh, I'm going to hunt and kill things, uh, but instead um, is, is much closer to his mother and, and, and cooks. And well, we, we may relate to that. The one who is obedient does what his mother says, but also the one who lies. Um, I think all of us can find a little bit. I'm not suggesting you're a liar. Um, I'm just suggesting that all of us are human. And Jacob is, is remarkably human. Um, and so I am drawn to him. I think he's about the first character so far in Genesis that I'm really drawn to. He fascinates me. And maybe that's the point. Maybe that's the point. Um, I don't know if Jacob 
knows what God said to Rebecca. Um, I only know that Jacob is is doing as his mother has asked him to do. Uh, I know that Jacob is looking out for himself. Well, yeah, but what if I get caught? What if he curses me instead? He's looking out for himself, no question. Self-interest. Uh, I have some of that myself. You might too. I don't know. Um, but what I do know in all of this, I may not, there's a lot of things I don't know, but what I do know is that Jacob is very human. And, uh, and I'm going to leave it there and we'll see what happens next. Because trust me, uh, in a moment, Esau is going to show up with his meal <laughs> and, and it's all going to fall apart. <laughs> but we'll wait for tomorrow to do that. So for now, let me offer a prayer. Loving God, we thank you for, for the opportunity to wonder. We thank you for a scripture that draws us in, not only into the words and into the story, but into ourselves. God, we thank you for the invitation to wonder whether we are following you or shaping you to go where we already wanted to go. We thank you for scripture that doesn't provide simple answers, but invites us to spend time wondering, praying, conversing with you. God, may today's wonder, today's conversation be fruitful. We pray through the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, that's enough for me today, but uh, we'll check in tomorrow and see what happens with Esau, right? And uh, until we do check in, God bless you. Please know that God sees you, that God loves you, and that God's love moves through you. Thank you for being you. We'll see you tomorrow.